WP. And now it's time for our first panel of the day, a discussion about how to create socially and ethically adept hybrid networks of humans and machines. Please join me in welcoming panelist Tish Shute, co-founder of AWE and former director of strategy and technology planning at FutureWay Technologies, along with our other panelists, Sean White, and Selm Hook, and David Smith. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I hope everyone's recovered from a wonderful party last night. Um, I just want to make one announcement because one of our panelists, Amber Case, uh, wasn't able to make the travel from New York today. And I'll be covering, it means I'll be wearing two hats, panelist and moderator, and we will probably evolve, hopefully not devolve, into a discussion. Um, but we're going to start with small, short introductions about some of the topics we are interested in discussing today and who and the panelists will introduce themselves. So, so we'll start perhaps with Sean. Ah, and yeah. All right. Uh, hi. It's nice to see everybody this morning. Those of you who decided not to go out onto the floor and try all the new optics and things like that, uh, and actually want to see this in real time. So uh, my name is Sean White. My first VR code was around 1994 in the uh, Banff Center for the Arts on a project called Placeholder. Uh, I've spent most of my time around either startups or academia, some teaching at uh, Stanford and Columbia, uh, or some large companies. Uh, most recently, I was the chief R&D officer at Mozilla, which makes Firefox. Um, and uh, so if you saw Mavic or Firefox, VR, hubs, any of those things, those were under our projects. I see some Mozillians in the audience today. Um, uh, and now I spend a lot of time working with startups, either in the spaces of AI, neurotech, mixed reality, uh, and a general set of projects like that, either advising or uh, prototyping or just generally helping out. So let's see. I'm going to start this. Um, when Tish asked me about the panel, uh, the question came up, at least in my mind, of which of these phrases you're going to valence, right? That is, are we talking about uh, ecological models of augmentation? That is, how we think about that as a, a conceptual model or framework? Or uh, how we actually augment living systems? That is, the, the world around us uh, is a reality, it's a physical reality, and uh, when we augment things around it, that becomes our reality as well. That is, uh, any light that hits my eye is reality through some augmentation. And so I, what I thought I would do just very briefly in the introduction is talk about a couple of examples of either that conceptual model or uh, augmenting ecologies, and then we can move on. So um, this first one, oh, that's what I just said, but you get the point. <laughs> Uh, so the first one uh, was a project around 2006, 2007 um, that was that, that version of actually augmenting the ecological world. That is, uh, trying to use augmented reality. In this case, it was Sony LDI 100B uh, headsets that were optical see-through and overlaying what uh, botanists were seeing. So this was done in collaboration with Columbia, the Smithsonian, and it actually showed the connections and the identities of things that were in the ecosystem um, with uh, botanists, with park rangers. It's amazing putting a headset on a park ranger uh, and, and having them see things that they couldn't normally see in the ecosystem. And part of this is in some ways starting to give a, uh, a voice and realizing uh, the lesson here that there is information all through the world. Niantic does a great job of uh, doing this and extracting this now, and there are tools for doing this, you know, decades later, um, has uh, increased significantly. Now, more in the, the modern sphere, this is a project that I work with called Earth Species Project. Now, if the ecosystem and its framing is that there, there's this sort of substrate, right? This environment and all these things in the ecosystem. Um, then what does it mean when we actually give a voice to those? I've worked on some art projects where we, for instance, gave a voice to the river. Um, in this case, this is a project that uh, is asking the question, what happens if we actually could communicate with as many non-human species as possible? I know that sounds kind of crazy, but 
the advances that we've seen, like at University of Edinburgh, and now everybody sort of knows about LLMs and about machine translation, ways in which we could actually apply those so that we can communicate with other species. Um, and so th th this project has a moonshot to do that um, and uh, is, is starting off with some pretty interesting results, which I'm happy to, happy to talk about. But what's interesting to me is it now is taking these things that we just thought of in some ways as window dressing um, and actually giving them agency, giving them something that's unpredictable. It's something that's in the ecosystem. Now, starting to flip this a little bit, this is a project called cognition.ai. Uh, yeah, there's a... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. That's right. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, now as we start thinking about how you apply ecosystem thinking to the projects that you do, um, uh, super proud to support this. Uh, cognition takes a combination of augmented reality and uh, EEG and starts to make models and understanding of what someone is trying to say and helps people, um, for instance, who have ALS communicate, helps them speak. Um, and that's just the C, just the beginnings, but it is an amazing beginning. And again, happy to talk about that as part of how we start to take some of the ecological models that we add in. And then finally, uh, leaning all the way into uh, ecosystem models, I just wanted to bring up a couple of things here, just two quick anecdotes. Um, and then I will have gone way past my five minutes, I apologize. But one of them is the Rust Foundation. Um, for some of you who are out in the audience, um, Rust is a programming language. You may never have even thought about it, but what was interesting about this was applying an ecological model to its success. And what I mean by that is we, we met with the team when I was at uh, Mozilla. You know, you might have these fitness functions, these things to try and make it successful, right? Uh, like, you know, more code or make this work better. But, but what the team came up with, which was really important, was actually a fitness function that other companies were going to pay and support for the success of Rust. They were going to have other, that success would be other companies paying to help make this survive. And the reason that was important is because that means it survives outside of your own organization, outside of your own company. And I can't think of a better example than that than all of the poor people who had put incredible amounts of time and effort into Altspace VR, um, and then had all of that work and their, their lives shut down, that doesn't happen with something like Mozilla Hubs, because even if Mozilla stops supporting it, the project's open source, the people control their own data. It, it's a very different model. And I'm not saying everything should be open source. That's not actually where I come from. Um, I think it's certain things are open source by design and has interesting implications for ecosystems. But I'll leave the rest for our conversations. Very nice to see you all uh, out in the audience, and I'll pass this on to Anson. Actually, I think I've got the next Oh, you got it? Okay. Uh, so, well, first is, I'm Tish Shoot. I'm um, co-founder of, of AWE with Ori. I, but I've from really, for the last eight years, have been really focused at the intersection of XR, AI, and simulation. And I think very few people have had the opportunity in their lives to work across silos, and it's, it really has changed my thinking. So I have a double title, Augmented Ecologies and Designing the Future of AI. And Augmented Ecologies, I, I understand this is a term that's going to just go a bit whoosh for the moment, but it's, it, you know, obviously that's standing in place for a lot of things, XR, AR, VR, MR, metaverse, metaverse, whatever. But, you know, naming things does actually change your thinking. And the term ecology for me stands, it stands for a switch I've made in my own thinking to something that Bruce Mao called life-centered design. And this is different from human-centric design in quite significant ways I think are super interesting for our future of all of us. And designing the future of our AI is a carefully picked set of words also because, and I think I can go on for, to my next slide uh, on this, um, that essentially, I mean, you're well aware at the moment that the idea that the singularity is underway is is on people's minds. 
And I'm very much... <laughs> that's why designing the future of AI is so significant, because there's one thing about the technological singularity, if you've ever you know, studied the sort of history of that term. Werner Vinge made a very clear point with it, that even if the technological singularity is imminent, the one thing you can't do is predict the form it will take. And there's a huge amount of energy mythologizing AI, speculating on the singularity, that I think should be spent on designing AI. And this is, I just get put this slide up because I think very few people get the opportunity to work across silos. So it's not well understood how AI is serving XR. Well, I think we do understand how AI is serving XR. What we don't understand properly in this whole sort of weird hype cycle thing where it's like, Metaverse, now AI. This is just madness of separating converging topics because XR is going to be serving AI in ways that actually do it, cause an acceleration because of this cycle I've got a, on this slide. And I think the missing piece to people understanding this is if you don't work in AI, you don't really know the significance of things like deep reinforcement learning. And if you look at that little cycle there, environment, 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 and think about this. Think of this huge leap the G chat GPTs have made with this giant data at scale about, you know, human data at scale that the internet provided. But this is data in the form of text and still images and not environment. I mean, just wrap your mind around what, ha what happens when the AI agents are in environments that are based on real world data. And the other topic, <laughs> Um, oh, well that was, I've already said this. If you want to see an example of what agents do in environments, check out the hide and seek research on OpenAI. And this is the Werner Vinge quote. Uh, it, it's really important to think about this because mythologizing and imagining what's going to happen with AI isn't going to take us where we want to go. Not at all, at all. We have to design where we want to go. <laughs> um, so. And this is the other thing that very, very few people think about. Um, but AI is serving simulation, and simulation is serving AI in extremely deep ways, from ultra-fast 1D simulation to something, and I think everyone in this panel, from David, Ansem, and Sean, we're really interested in simulation in ways that make it accessible, not just to you know, the few handful of giant companies or deep researchers in the world, but actually a tool for everyone to design their own futures and understand the world they live in. So, and just to go back to my, a little bit of my history, and which again, I think connects with everyone here, is I'm really, and it comes from this, you know, this, the understanding of games where, you know, Will Wright is one of the most, I mean, he is the preeminent designer of simulation games in a way that makes them accessible to, you know, at scale, to vast, you know, it's, he, he, The Sims was the most successful game in PC history at one point. I don't know where things stand now. But it's all about this, how you, no one, no one at the moment when they talk about AI is thinking in this way, is that how do you design models that actually put the user in the driver's seat. And yes, it's, you know, if you're doing a game, we, you know, obviously Will is also the great designer for emergent behavior. And, you know, in a game, it's, it can be quite fun to have emergent behavior around burning other people's houses down, which wouldn't be at all fun in real life. So yes, there's a, you know, there's a, a tr you know, when you're transitioning the idea of player driven or, or uh, the player being in the driver's seat, there are many new challenges when you're thinking about real-world data and real-world simulations. Um, and this is, an, this is something I think we all very, very deeply involved in, is the idea of, and I hope we discuss this quite a lot, because we need personal AIs to protect and enable our agency and interests and act on our behalf with institutional AIs and help us accomplish our goals. I think there's a few startups now doing personal AIs, but certainly know this panel has thought very, very deeply about this model and 
when I say you know, running niche LMMs there, I'm talking about exactly what Sean's talking about. I can't wait till we communicate with the, the life systems of our planet better. Maybe then we will be on the right track to designing the future of AI. And just a personal thing, I really want my personal digital strategist. I've been working in techno technology strategy and planning for like nearly eight years. And I would like for my own life to have a digital strategist who can run simulations about my possible futures, please. Um, and I'm just going to be very quick because I think I'm getting down. This is the end of the time. And all the slides from here on are available on my LinkedIn because they come from other talks. But I just want to set up one more thing. Um, that the way we're thinking at the minute, we are designing AI for 1% of the population. And that 1% is already responsible for the same level of carbon emissions as the poorest 3.1 billion people on the planet. This, it, we can't be ostriches. You've got, you know, this is real. <laughs> um, and this is, this is where, I mean, I've been hugely influenced by Bruce Mao's framing of life-centered design. It's actually very, very hard to say something like that. We're still doing most things as if nature had unlimited resources. We work as if waste is not a problem. We treat nature like a pantry and a toilet. It's very strong, but you have to be strong in a way that you can communicate and inspire people to you know, make the changes at the scale we need to make them. And I'm going, this is going to be my last slide because I see myself going over. Um, and I don't think there are many AI designers here, but one of, one of the things if you're designing you know, models to work on grand scales and huge amounts of data is heuristics are just vital. And what are heuristics? They're shortcuts that help you manage these giant problems when you can't put an algorithm to it. And this switch of putting design, instead of subsuming it under business, to putting it on top, to me, is the heuristic that's excited me to say this, that we can design the future of AI. I'm not going to talk to these slides because I do not think we have time. I will flick through. This is hugely important to me because basically what we're living in is a tragedy of the commons on the Earth and the ocean. And it, we have an opportunity in space to do this right. If you listen to my fireside chat with, with Dan Suarez yesterday, you, you'll heard, heard a lot about that. It's really a big deal. Um, and then this like, is really for this audience. We need new tools of representation so we can cross boundaries between giant data sets from the sky and local ecosystems when we're actually talking to non-humans and, and yeah, the horses and the fish. And gosh, I, I can't wait for that. Um, and it's a quite complex problem. I won't go into it, but you, you really do need, it is languages of rep representation. It's very da domain suspicious specific, which is why I'm a big fan of niche LLMs, and I do not think the giant models will win, like currently I think most people do. And go, You can see these slides. Definitely want to refer you to this designer, Brett Victor, whose, he, whose ideas on this about what, how this new so, social collaboration between nature and humans and non-humans can change everything. How can we actually do what Bruce Mao says, we've got to change everything. I mean, that's totally uh -huh. scary. But when you look at some of Brett's thinking and some of these videos, you can see we can change everything through design. Um, and now, <laughs> thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Anselm Hook. Uh, I also was at Mozilla Research. I, uh, I'm very excited to be here. I, I wanted to uh, respond a little bit to something that you'd been talking about, which is this idea of uh, Bruce Mao's uh, heuristics. What was interesting for me about that, and before I go into any slides, was that we as developers and designers are often looking for guidance in what we're building. We're trying to kind of pick between two choices. And you see these ideas like human-centered design as a, as a set of principles that you kind of measure your work by or you see uh, Bruce Mao's thinking, or the work that Amber Case and uh, Mark Weiser did with the Xerox Park thinking around calm technology. The, the, the thing is, I think that it's, it's kind of worthwhile to take the time to look at our philosophical underpinnings. And it's worth 
it to look at some of these names that are being mentioned because they help us ground our work. And I, and I, I actually, almost this year, it seems like I've started to notice this more and more that everyone here has a, a kind of a philosophical underpinning behind their work. Whether you declare it or not, you do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's yeah. good to declare it. <laughs> so, uh, briefly, uh, my uh, underpinning is that I was an old school game developer. And it seems like everything's kind of coming back around to the same idea over and over. And maybe it's just my perspective. But, it, but uh, as a game developer, your job is to work with designers and you translate their ideas. You, you listen very carefully to a lot of very creative people and you try to pluck out ideas for them that you can turn into code and expose back to them as a tool chain. So that they can, you basically extract a grammar and then you give them the tools to build an experience. And so there's always been a pattern in my industry to effectively build a kind of agent container, and then a bunch of heterogeneous agents of different flavors are running inside that container. And it's kind of a mindset I've always been, uh, I don't know, it's, it, now I just see the world in that way. So my current work is I had a uh, grant from Huawei to, uh, from FutureWay to explore uh, next generation browsers. And under that uh, motif, if you think about the, um, the upcoming Apple headset, you can imagine that you have this thing on your face, and it's not probably going to be separate apps that are running. You're not going like, to switch from tab to tab or open an app and run an app. You're probably going to have something that's more like a bunch of agents interacting with each other, where some agents are doing some heavy lifting, like doing a 3D reconstruction and tracking of the world and extracting geometric features. And then another smaller agent is putting funny hats on people's heads. So there's a, there's a way that these agents will work together. And it, it, that kind of agent mindset, for me, starts to expose these ideas around the kind of an augmented ecology. Not so much an ecology in environmental terms, but in the ecology in, in terms of a, a system or container that uses the idea of many small pieces working together rather than kind of a top-down command and control architecture that we have been traditionally familiar with as consumers of these, of these tools. Yeah. My current project is a sandbox for doing this. Uh, I see that we have a lot of agents around us all the time, and I think that maybe we can shift that a little bit. I, I think that if we start to, to kind of understand and appreciate that we have power over these tools, we can participate in composing them. And I'd love to see people build their own experiences and share them and share agents, especially empowered by the new LLMs and the new technology that's emerging. It, it kind of makes everyone into a programmer. And for me, that's really exciting. It's not even so much necessarily reclaiming agency per se. I do think that will happen. But more, I think that there's an emergent possibility of these agents collaborating with each other to produce to produce richer outcomes than you can program from the top down. And, and that, it's that emergence that you see in, in mm -hmm. ecosystems that I, I find just so fascinating. It's a different way of thinking about work. Um, so one of the, uh, and this is my last slide, for uh, Orbital, uh, I'm building these agent containers that are basically simulation sandboxes where you can load up agents and, and throttle them and make sure they don't do bad things and, and set limits on the, what they can, they can interact. And I'm working with a, uh, a real world, physical real world, uh, reef uh, habitat project called PRISM. And they're bringing uh, people, they're building this uh, uh, an acrylic underwater habitat where people can go down for several days and spend real time underwater. And so I'm building a digital twin of that to play test the ergonomics, the uh, reef impact, the, the interaction of all these forces to uh, you know, help them validate their model. And so for me, that's an ex it's because I've become very interested in scuba diving and in that community, it's a good exercise. But also, it helps me validate the idea of, of uh, the digital twin uh, tooling that lets anyone throw in you know, digital fish and, and swarming behaviors and, and maybe simulate upwelling and colder currents impacting the, the reef and how that benefits the reef. And you can uh, keep an eye on this project. It's at Orbital Foundation. It's ongoing. I hope to have some richer demos soon. I hope I don't even know where I am with time on that one. You're fine. <laughs> there we are. I think good. Did you press that button? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm David Smith, uh, CTO of Croquet. I've been 
I guess the right word is obsessed with uh, the technologies that are permeating this space for certain. Uh, going way back in time, uh, I created my first head mount in 1985. That was actually uh, intended to be enable me to do um, telepresence with a um, robotic arm. Uh, what I, I had a data glove at the time, and I was using the headset to basically project myself into that space. And I could move when I moved my hand, the robot arm moved, and I could pick things up and move them around. By the way, you can see a video of it, uh, David A. Smith 3D on YouTube, and it was a profound experience. I was someplace else, but I was here, and being able to do that in 1985. By the way, I think the 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 resolution of that little micro, those micro TVs was about 320 pixels across, if that. Uh, but it was profound and magical. Uh, I got very uh, into interactive uh, 3D. I, I, I wrote the first real-time 3D adventure shooter game called The Colony. That came out in 87, not too long after that. Um, I wound up working with Jim Cameron uh, on the design of um, th his movie, The, the Abyss. Uh, and then uh, uh, Tom Clancy uh, played my game, got real excited, and so I wound up cr uh, creating a game called Rainbow Six. But all of these things were just building on each other and understanding the, the, this, the, the liveness of these virtual worlds was, was very, very profound. About that same time, I started con con uh, talking to Alan Kay. Alan, if you don't no, he, he's considered the father of the personal computer. He coined the term object-oriented programming. But his vision of computing certainly coincided with mine. And what we saw very import importantly was this idea that um, the next steps in human-computer interaction was going to be two big things. One is interactive 3D, which is something I was particularly excited about. But the other more important one was this idea of collaboration and interaction. And I'm going to kind of do a, a, a little bit of a deeper dive into a particular aspect of that that emerged out of that. Uh, one of the things that happened, by the way, is Alan and I and David Reed, who was the creator of uh, UD, the UDP protocol and co-created TCP IP, created the Croquet platform, which is what we've been building. And as you can actually, you need to go check that out if, you, if you're interested in this stuff. We, we have a booth. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the like I said, a deeper dive, talking about this idea of what language is. We've talked about large language models, but language, I, I really came to a deep understanding, is, is this virtual machine running the top of the hardware that, that is, is your brain. Um, this, oddly enough, this is how you think. When you think about uh, ideas, you do planning, you tell stories, that's all based upon that language. And in fact, large language models work the same way. They're, they're generating ideas and stories based upon this virtual machine that's running on hardware, right? Uh, so you actually do think in terms of language, but it's not just speech. Uh, anyone who's a musician uh, understands that music is a language. It's a different kind of idea space, but it's just as powerful and sometimes even more powerful, certainly emotionally. Uh, mathematics, of course, and, and you know when you're when you're a musician, you think in a very different way. You know you're thinking a different way. When you play jazz, you are in a different place. Mathematics is the same thing. You you're able to think ideas that without that language you could never access. Uh, think about our entire society is based on the power of mathematics. That we we able to construct these idea spaces. Without that, you know, there's no way we could achieve it. But this is this wonderful virtual machine running on our in, in our brains. Anybody is a programmer. The reason we call code languages, same damn thing. We are able to express ideas that are not expressible with traditional languages like English. So I know you're defined more by any more than anything by how you communicate. You you explore idea spaces uh, in that way. But importantly, the whole point of language is to enable us to collaborate. That was uh, how we survived as a species and why we are such a powerful species is we learn to collaborate. There's no, no such thing as a human in these ecosystems. Humans are where the power has always been. And what I see coming, and, and 
uh, Tish actually talked about that quite a bit. Collaboration AI and what I call metaverse, but you can call it XR, is going to redefine what we are and, and what it means to be human. Um, and I'm going to talk about this really briefly, but this augmented conversation is it's, it's another language on top of what we've just been talking about. It allows us, humans, and AIs to jointly invent and explore new universes. And here's a few features of that. Uh, one, a discussion with a group of users that is extraordinarily enhanced with the tools and capabilities that are only available with a computer. Obviously, AI is that. Um, the second is computer AI is a full participant. It's not just something on the side here. It actually listens, it, it expands the scope of the conversation, it reifies the ideas, it generates those ideas as part of the simulation that you can engage with. And remember, this is part of a conversation with another human. Um, one key element is it has to be a guarantee of shared truth, which means AI sometimes have to be checked at the door, but however, the, the simulation I see has to be exactly the same as what you see and anything I do to affect that simulation, you should see it as I do it. Otherwise, you can't trust it. And finally, uh, shared systems have to enable us bid identical modification extensions of that systems for all participants. That's one of the reasons, by the way, we created Croquet. It's a platform that actually enables just that. So this is, um, oddly enough, when I talk about augmented conversation, we see the, the scope of uh, where the world is today. You have to go back in time a bit, actually you have to go back in time about over 60 years. The primary factor of how we got to here with the technologies that have been uh, built from the beginning of certainly computer science uh, reflects the original creator's intent to enable computers as symbiotic partners in this augmented conversation. So what I'm talking about is not at all a new idea. If you're familiar with Doug Engelbart's work, from the, the 60s, you'll understand and have a perfect uh, perspective of where we are today and what's necessary. And um, this paper, oddly enough, Man-Computer Symbiosis, this is 1960. Um, eight JCR Licklider, and why this is so important is Licklider launched the ships that we are on today. He's the guy that got ARPA to fund people like Ivan Sutherland, who obviously created uh, what we think of as our field of VR, AR. He, he funded the, the, the work of Doug Engelbart that really is beyond just inventing the mouse. He invented basically everything I think of as far as important to computer, computer science today. And of course, he, the, that ARPA also funded um, Alan Kay's work that led to the very foundations of the computer that you're using in your pocket or on your screen today. It's not an accident that we're now at the position of having massively powerful computers and massively power AIs. The real trick is this. We have now a fork in the road. One direction is where the AIs are predominant and powerful and control society, a surveillance society possibly, probably. And the other choice is we embrace AIs to become and extend what we are. And this is, uh, this is a choice that exists today and has to be acted on today. And this is why this is such an important kind of conversation, especially in, in this venue, because the, AIs plus XR plus other people, the collaboration, this augmented conversation has to be, I think, the future of what we are. That's it. And thank you. So, thank you, everybody. Yes. These are big ideas, and we were sort of glad we were Friday because it's a lot to process. And <laughs> I just want to start off with a, a very, you know, just simple question, but it will probably expand a lot. What, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists to speak on this, but start with Sean. What, it, what is an ecological mindset? Because Sean, actually, one of the reasons I got involved with co-finding this event was I saw an app that Sean had built in 2008 or 9, just before I met Ori and we started getting um, excited by this. It, it was uh, basically an app that gave you a representation of pollution in various areas of New York City, and he had collaborated with urban planners and architects. And 
just because we're in our many discussions, and that's why we miss Amber a lot, because we had a lot of discuss wonderful discussions leading up to this. And what, one of the questions you, you raised was, could an ecological mindset have helped Facebook make a better decision before they dropped a huge amount of money into VR? Um, so what is an ecological mindset in your View. Sure. Uh, although I, I think I was talking about Microsoft in that case. Oh, um, okay. But, but, but that's fine. It doesn't um, matter anyone. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think the the observation about the ecological mindset was that um, maybe if I I'll use three examples. Yeah. There there was a, a a system I was using with a company where they had locked down their their hardware their system. There was no developer program. There was no way to do anything with it. We reverse engineered it a little bit so that we could do something with it. Um, and in a way, nobody cared. When it rose, it rose. When it died, it died. Right. Um, there are uh, companies that have developer programs, that have app stores, that ha start to build an ecosystem that it, uh, in some cases is very managed and controlled, in some cases not. Um, at that point, other people start to care about the success of that. And that, you know, to use the phrase, it sort of uh, lifts all boats, yeah. right? Um, and then the, that third model uh, is that you know, sometimes there are some pieces of that where you want everybody contributing. It is a commons, right? Yeah. Uh, and so my, my mental model for uh, the ecological mindset is a, a, a bit like what Anselm was saying. There, there is a, a substrate, a sandbox, a place in which you have a set of very simple ways for things to interact, um, but you also have all of these objects in the environment. You have these systems in the environment. You have things that are working together or against each other, but in the environment. Um, and they, they care about the environment, and they start to create equilibriums. Mm -hmm. The reason why I think that's interesting is because, um, you know, uh, particularly now, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, historically, uh, computer scientists have thought in a very deterministic way, right? That is, we, we write some code and do the incantation, and something happens that we can predict. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> in, in recent history, with LLMs, with different approaches we have, we're kind of moving to a probabilistic model. That is, it, it's non-deterministic. Yeah. And that actually uh, is much more amenable to an, uh, an ecosystem frame of mind than the more deterministic yeah. okay. God's eye version of that. Thank you. That's really, actually, my mind's already <laughs> spinning on that. Um, Ansem, what is an ecological mindset to you? It's actually interesting. I kind of almost have a new take on it just now, just thinking about it. The, there's a way that we place humans at the center of most of our design and it's a kind of pre-Copernican philosophy. But in an ecology, we're not necessarily at the center. We're a part of a larger system. And we interact with that system. The system perturbs us, and, and we try to perturb it back. And when you push on things too hard, you have bad side effects and, and unexpected outcomes. So I, I think, for me, an ecological mindset is, is kind of maybe taking a longer-term view thinking about the longer-term outcomes of the systems you build, the tools you build, the impacts they're going to have on the people around you, and trying to be mindful. Uh, and, and, and obviously, that's not easy. It takes real work. But simply, it's, it's a mindset of, of recognizing that we're not necessarily able to dominate anymore the, the software tools and systems we have. I'd love to speak to how that dovetails with the real ecologies that were around this, but I, I think that just to answer your question, that's where I would go right it's now. I mean, it's fabulous because I think this is such an important question because right now, you know, we're, we're basically in this probabilistic future, and, and this is where computing is taking us, emerging behavior <coughs> is a given at this point. And I think very few people can wrap their head around how to think about this outside of like, oh, we're going to be taken over eventually, and the mythologizing of AI. And it gives us a design principle that we can work mm. with. But just to get David's yeah. take on an ecological so mindset. I think of the, the real hallmark of ecologies are systems that are allowed to evolve. In other words, I mean, you think about a walled garden is 
Uh, it, it's very controlled, constrained, constructed. I think of it as, oh, I'm going to grow this field of corn, and then the, ac the e evolution of that field is very specific and, and controlled and constrained, where a healthy ecosystem is going to go in unpredictable ways that uh, always, by the way, improve its ability to succeed. That's the very definition of a healthy ecosystem mm -hmm. is that, that evolution. And I think that's really the key characteristics is why walled gardens are always going to never be able to keep up because they can't evolve at the same pace. They can't do the same kinds of things. So this is, uh, to, to me, the, the big difference. And I think these, are, these things are still like ecosystems, but they're not healthy if they're not evolving. Yeah, yeah, that's really fantastic. Um, I think I want just to do one more, a couple more formal questions, and then I'm going to... We have quite little time, but I, I would like <laughs> each of you to ask a question after this one. Um, many people agree that we need personal AIs. So we've brought, I think, Ansem and I, and everyone brought this up, <laughs> um, to act on our behalf with institutionalized AIs and help us accomplish our goals. And, and what is the most important characteristics, in your view? And I'll start maybe in the middle this time, because you're looking at me, Ansem. Um, <laughs> what are the most important characteristics of of personal AIs and, in your view, to accomplish our goals? So I, I definitely feel like we are moving to a, a world away from uh, apps, more towards agents. And I do think that uh, we weekly use agents today, but it's, it's, it's not quite as agentful as I would imagine. I think a trait I would like to see is uh, durability, like it can run in the background, be your advocate on your behalf, even when you're not actively paying attention to it. And of course it requires, if you have hundreds of agents, that they have some sort of arbitration. Uh, so I, I think that uh, durability. Another thing I think is that anyone should be able to compose these and I, we're seeing this now with the LLMs, and that's what's so exciting, is that I really want to push that power back to people in general. Um, I think a third trait is that I'd lo I want to see these agents talk to each other, not just... We tend to see, like, if you look at, like, Cloudflare workers, you have little, effectively, agents in the cloud that handle your HTTP requests. But I would like to see more of a cloud of agents that interact with each other to broker uh, outcomes that, that you're looking for. So I, I, I'm seeing a different kind of... Uh, uh, world moving away from apps to this kind of personal agent with uh, richer uh, possibilities for people. And also you're talking about a new medium for these agents. So oh, that well, yes. that's a given, right? You're, yeah, a given. you're presuming that these, this medium will exist, yeah. yeah. Um, I think David next. Is, and then we'll yeah, uh, personal AIs are uh, I think extraordinarily important, and more, more so than you might imagine. I, I think in a, in a lot of ways that these massive AIs are in, somewhat, in some ways assaulting humanity. And, in, and they don't know that, of course, but in a sense that they're, they're taking over a lot of the things that humans uh, should have control and agency over. But the other part of it is, of course, uh, the security side. They're not just collecting information about us, but they're actually creating models uh, of us to be able to, first of all, predict what we're going to do, and the other side, of course, is then the control. Uh, what is essential when we think about a, a personal AI is what I call prophylactic. It has to be, first of all, able to understand that you're under an attack, because you are, and the other is help defend against that. That means this AI can't be one of those big uh, AIs in the cloud. It has to be part of you. In fact, any, uh, any attack on that, uh, on that AI is a, basically an attack on you. As, it's a violent act. So it's really essential that that, that, that next-gen AI be uh, very, very intimate with you. In fact, maybe in some ways not even connected to the rest of that infrastructure, but certainly, certainly very, very well co connected to you. Um, th and and so that, that's just, um, and one other point is, by the way, this is not like, oh, well, you know, we're going to have these crappy cheapo AIs that are attached to us. I think in five years or so, we're going to see uh, AI systems that, in the size of a phone that's probably a thousand times more powerful than uh, GPT-4 today. 
the, it's just the curve is there. We're, you know, when we think about Moore's Law, it's gone uh, for our traditional approaches, but when you have most, mo massively parallel systems, Moore's Law is more than alive. So I, I think in five, certainly outside of 10, we're gonna see systems that uh, are uh, extraordinarily powerful, but again, is gonna be wearable. Sure. Um, well, uh, certainly, I, I think that the things that you've talked about feel right. Um, I think there are three areas that I would care about in particular, in addition to that with personal AIs. And they come from some of the, the projects that I've started to see, whether that was uh, an AI for mental health or an AI that is mm -hmm. um, like some of the work out of UT Austin that is helping um, read what is the thoughts in your brain. Um, to help you communicate. Um, and so those things, I think, are one, trust. Um, and this, this comes from my uh, Mozilla hat, I think. Uh, one of the things that none of you would do is go to uh, Big Joe's bank and ribs and then hand them all of your money and your credit card. You, you started trusting that there was this thing called a browser, and you picked your browser, and you trusted that the people with the tinfoil hats and the thugs and the people that worked for the browsers were gonna do the right thing in your stead. Right? Yeah. Um, and building up that trust is significant, particularly um, it, when you have something that is a personal AI, because these systems, if you think that your browser in some ways, or whatever system you use, knows you intimately, these will probably know you even more intimately as we, we start to use more sensors, as we start to look at more perception and actuation in the world around us. Um, my sense is that the, the, the second thing is that they will really be focused on augmentation. And in this part, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I think you know, it's a completely separate thing, but it is yours. That is, if it really is personal, um, I've seen some projects where, you know, the personal AI is a kinder AI. I think that's really interesting. Um, but for instance, Siri always has Siri's voice, and Siri, I, I mean, I use Siri. I, I think it's a great product, but it, it's all, it's, Siri works for somebody else, not for me. No. It's not in the voice that I'm, I'm looking for. Um, and, and so I, I think in terms of augmentation of those things, that, that feels important. Yeah. That was a really good point that yeah. Siri works for someone else. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. That is, encodes everything. It really is yeah. quite, yeah. Quite. And, right. and, and, and you can, from a, from an, uh, now from a, an, a user experience and an HCI point of view, which I think is my third point, yeah. um, I think that there are things you can do, whether that is the voice that you choose or the, the personal knowledge that you have, or even using um, models from uh, fantasy or mythology like familiars. I've always really liked the idea from like Bill Pullman or even you go back into history about familiars. Um, I, I think there are things that we can do from an interface point of view uh, to make those feel personal and feel different in ways that, again, are not more general or for yeah. somebody else. And I think that's an incredibly important point for the XR community because we really need to think very strongly about langu languages of representation from per for personal AIs. And, you know, just the box of the anthropomorph anthropomorphic avatar is not enough. It's just you know, one tiny slice of what those, those languages of representation could be. I'm a, I'm a multi-agent person. Some people think we'll have one. But to me, it's almost an interactive map of self and how you, it may be abstract. It may not be an avatar as we know it. So I think that's a really great, the, your last point is such an important question for the XR community. And we are down to five minutes, which could mean Probably one audience question. <laughs> um, is there a burning question? Because otherwise, I'm going to ask another. Some, one well, of I had a follow up for you too of something oh, you, you just said. Uh -oh. yeah. okay. <laughs> we'll cancel the next talk. Audience <laughs> question at it's all? Like, let's um? see if there's a burning question. Oh, yeah. One burning question. It's a big one, unfortunately. <laughs> um, <laughs> we got five minutes. <laughs> TechCrunch disrupt a long time ago. There was a company called Tanchi Dot that was placing air tags oh, around we love Tokyo. <laughs> now, um, so let's say I'm on unseated Ohlone land here. Um, I'm listening to a conference about augmenting ecosystems. Both of those are true. Both of them could be air tags, but how are we going to do like a wiki commons peer review of what's true for which contexts and 
Um, and how do we create the information ecosystem that will allow us to augment our shared realities? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and then I'm going to... I, 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 I mean, I'd love to comment on this briefly. When you, so for me, what jumps out in what you're talking about, uh, one point is trust. How do we know what's real? We're being inundated with a lot of, a lot of increasingly a lot of media that could be not trustworthy, and also the bad actors. I, I actually think that is such a big problem it exists outside of this. It, it, it's a fundamental issue on the net in general. We haven't built a kind of a, a trust service. I do think that there are a set of techniques. If you look at a small town, the way that people build trust, they, they, uh, trust in depth is built based on identifying other parties in person, establishing trust graphs and transitive, and you can do this trip cryptographically to some degree. But I think that just picking on that one part of your statement, that is, we could have a whole conference on that one topic, mm -hmm. and, but I don't want to run That's off right. the, let other people but I, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm, in part, this is already starting to get discussed. Um, so there, in Ohio, there was a, a city council. They wanted to stop people from playing Pokemon Go uh, in this park, and so they were trying to prevent people from projecting their Pokemons into the park. Uh, so, you know, a sort of first salvo about um, who gets to choose what is represented in a system, in a space that is beyond our physical space. Again, just it, it is real, it's a conceptual space, but it's not the physical space. And my sense is that uh, um, much like history, um, it will continue to be rewritten. We'll probably actually always want to be able to represent the context, right? The point of view and the context in those things. So we, we do it because I just don't think that there's going to be you know, one absolute truth about who gets to decide That's right. what is in a place. So trust is a, a social construct. It basically, the, the things that you trust, are, and, and anybody who's in politics today understands this deeply, that the things that you trust and believe in are false in the other side, always, right? I mean, it's just the very nature of why we have these wars, we have, uh, and so the trust is something that you know, it's like, it's so context sensitive. You know, I, I believe him because, I don't know why you believe him, but you do. And, and then therefore anything he says is the truth. I did not rape that woman. Yeah, of course he didn't, he couldn't have. But that's a social construct that, that uh, may have no basis whatsoever in reality, but reality kind of never does matter. Trust is not a, a, a truth, oddly enough. We actually have one minute left, so I'm going <laughs> to put out a final question, which is to the audience as much as it is to the panelists, because we won't come up with anything. I might ask you to do like 20-second <laughs> answers. But because you mentioned Tonchi Dot, I mean, Bruce Sterling, who is very, one of the seminal design fiction authors that really was part of the founding of this event, was here at an early event, and he saw Tonchi Dot, and he really... He really liked Tonchi Dot. He saw a lot of interesting things he wrote about them. And I want, this is the final question. It's to everyone in the audience. It's to all panelists. Bruce Sterling set the stage for augmented technologies at, at, that we were at the dawn of augmented reality. This was in 2010. It's a wonderful speech at the Lair event in a chapel in Amsterdam. He said it was a big pie, and careful how we, how we divide it up. It matters. Mm -hmm. How have we done? dividing up this pie. What did we miss? And what did we overindulge in? Um, and what is the real place of these technologies? I think that's the big, those are the big questions for all of us. And I think we'll, obviously, you have, oh, four Zero seconds. seconds. <laughs> you can have one or two words each. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Be careful about what you build. Yeah. And I hope we just you know, continue this conversation. We understand this, these are big ideas and it's early, but it matters to all of us how we answer these, these questions. And thank you for coming today after the party. And thank you. Thank you to all Thanks. the panelists and to Amber Case, who unfortunately at the last minute couldn't come. We had a wonderful lead up to this panel talking about these ideas, and I hope we have many opportunities to talk about them in the future. And Tish, thank you for organizing. Yes, oh, thank you. Pleasure, pleasure. Thanks. Yeah. And thank everyone. <laughs>